Here's a five-minute non-technical explanation of where the internet comes from, how it works, and what it has to do with nuclear weapons. While almost all of us jumped on the internet in the 90s, its story begins all the way back in 1957 when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first man-made satellite. At the time, the United States knew the Soviets had nukes. And now the U.S. knew that the Soviets could launch things that could reach around the world. Suddenly, we were scrambling to catch up technologically and figure out how we could better defend ourselves in the event of a nuclear war. One of the many projects that arose from this decision was an effort to make a computer network that could continue to operate even if we were attacked. See, up until this time, computers were connected through a centralized server. One big computer would run the show, handling the communications between the smaller computers. This worked well enough, but it presented a problem when thinking about a nuclear attack. That big computer needs a lot of room, a lot of power, a lot of people, and it needs to be plugged directly into each and every other computer on the network. That makes your master computer impossible to conceal, and at the same time, paints a great big bullseye on it, telling the enemy, blow this thing up if you want to wreck our communications and ruin our day. Sure, you could put the computer underground or hide it in a mountain base like a Bond villain, but if a nuclear bomb goes off, then the shockwave could just bury your base or take out the power source, or the electromagnetic burst could fry your computer equipment. And if you survived all that, all the people you hired to take care of the computer will probably die of thirst, hunger, and radiation poisoning. No, a single master computer is just too important and fragile a target. We needed a better answer, and that answer is called packet switching. Packet switching is a system where the messages are broken up into little pieces and passed across the network. When the pieces arrive, they can be reassembled and the original message read. Everything you download on the internet, web pages, images, movies, games, everything is broken up this way and sent to you in pieces called packets. Picture a classroom full of kids, all passing notes to each other. One kid writes a note and then wants to deliver it to a kid on the other side of the room. But instead of delivering it directly, he can just hand it off in the correct direction. In turn, that person can hand it off and to another person, and so on, until it gets where it's going. When a kid is handed a note, they don't need to know the exact location of every other person in the room. They just look and see that this packet is addressed to row 4, seat 2. That's off to the right and in front of you a bit, so hand the packet off in that direction. Now if a few pieces of our computer system are taken out in a nuclear attack, the rest can continue to work. As long as there is a route between two points, traffic can still make it. Now the only way to break the network is to kill every single computer connected to it. And if that happens, then everybody is probably dead anyway, so it doesn't matter if the network is up or not. Obviously, the network has grown beyond its original intent. It's evolved from being a private tool of the U.S. government to being an open global network that is used for entertainment, commerce, and education. All of this stuff, from Facebook to blogs to online games to the video you're watching right now, are basically a really awesome accident. Let's look at a few bits of jargon you've probably seen thrown around the internet. Ping is a pretty simple idea, but people are sometimes confused by it because it's used as both a noun and verb. When you ping a computer on the internet, you send them a special kind of packet that doesn't contain any real information, just a request that the other computer send a reply. This is useful if you want to see how fast and stable your connection is. Remember, there are a lot of other computers between you and the destination. Any one of those intermediate points could be slowing things down. Sending this message and getting a reply is called pinging, and the time it takes for the round trip is called your ping time. When your ping time gets high enough that it begins to interfere with your usage of the internet, people call it lag. Hops is the number of times a packet changes hands before it reaches its destination. Packets don't always get to where they're going. Maybe a server goes down, or a connection is broken, or there's a nuclear war that blows up half the internet. It happens. Sometimes packets are sent that can't reach their destination, now, if we didn't allow for this, then those packets would just accumulate forever. Servers would pass these lost packets around until they clogged the network. So packets have what's called a time to live, which is how many hops a packet is allowed to make. Every time the packet is sent to another server, one is subtracted from its time to live. If a server ever gets a packet that has a time to live of zero, then it's safe to assume that the packet is lost and can be discarded. So that's a bit about the internet. Luckily, you don't need to know all of this to use it. It just works. 
You can check your email, chat on Facebook, edit Wikipedia, and all of this happens automatically in the background. I think it's pretty cool. Thanks for watching. Thank you.